The retrial of Shelly Silver kicking into high gear. We're at the courthouse in Lower Manhattan with a look at where this case is headed and whether it will have a different result than round one. Then a whole lot of Republican primaries have candidates who are going full steam ahead trying to attract the Trump base. One of them right in our area. The question is, will that strategy backfire? And we look across the aisle at whether or not the Democrats are divided and if that will hurt them come November. Evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Thanks for joining us. Well, we start tonight at the retrial of Sheldon Silver. He, the former Speaker of the New York State Assembly. Now, even though opening statements started just yesterday, we already have some dramatic testimony. And for that, let's bring in Dominic Carter. Of course, he's at the federal courthouse in lower Manhattan with the very latest. Dom? And good evening to you, Richard. In order to obtain a conviction, prosecutors have used, as you've been saying night after night, they must prove a quid pro quo. And today's witness, Richard, was all about that. Dr. Tob, what was it like testifying today? No comment. Dr. Robert Tobb, now retired and in frail condition after Columbia University fired him for his interactions with then Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver, spent most of the day on the witness stand. Tom admitted he knew he was making Silver wealthy by providing medical referrals for lawsuits. Tom's patients, people with mesothelioma, a deadly cancer caused by asbestos exposure. The feds say in return, Silver provided $500,000 in state grants to Tom for medical research. Tom testified, quote, we had a business relationship. Todd said he referred 25 to 50 cases over 10 years to Silver. The law firm employing Silver, Weitz and Luxembourg, paid Silver some $3 million. On the witness stand, Todd admitted to lying to FBI agents when they visited him. The doctor said he told the FBI that he had not referred cases to Silver. In front of the jury, he said, quote, I was terrified of losing my job. The feds gave him immunity to testify. Tom also said Silva was very good at getting people to owe him. Dr. Tom. He's not going to comment. Dr. Tom. He's not going to comment. Mr. Silva, here we are at a second trial. How do you feel? I feel fine. The case will be tried in the courtroom, not in the media. All right, Dominic, it's got a little feel of Groundhog Day. We've been here before, and I guess it'll be the same kind of thing with the Dean Skelos trial that'll be coming up uh, at the conclusion of this one. Is it basically the same trial on the same case that the prosecution is going to lay out like they did before, except we're going to have a different jury instruction? Your assessment is dead on 1,000%. Exactly the same case from federal prosecutors. The same star witness, as we heard from, well, he wouldn't comment to us, but Dr. Robert Tobb, uh, who was fired from, from Columbia University, Richard, the star witness. So the only thing that's different, you have all different prosecutors now, and that charge that you just referred to, this case may very well come down to it. The appellate court uh, concluded that the charge from Judge Caproni, that they've narrowed the definition under McDonald of corruption, and it's the charge that had this case overturned. So it's almost, to your point, exactly to the T, the same case, except there will be a different charge from this same judge, Valerie Caproni, who is also the judge in the uh, Pococo trial, Richard. All right. Uh, well, of course, Tom, will continue to follow the fire fireworks. Thank you so much. All right, let's bring in our panel right now to get into this and much more. Amy Siskind is president of the New Agenda and also author of The List. Charlie King, New York co-chairman of the Mercury Public Affairs, and he was a senior campaign advisor to Andrew Cuomo's re-election campaign, and Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent. And Charlie, I start with you. Do you think we are any closer to being able to define um, what corruption is. I, I swear to God, I spent the last year of my life, whether or really Dominic has, whether he's going out uh, doing the Menendez trial or now he's on round two of the Silver or the, uh, you know, the Skelos trial. Then you have the Buffalo Billions, obviously Percoco. Uh, we saw what happens and then in June. He gets sentenced, I believe. It seemingly is never ending. Do we at least define the term now? 
I mean, look, I think it's very comp. In some ways, it's some places it's it's cut and dry where corruption is, and I think in other ways it's it's a, it's a slippery slope. And I think that some of the cases that prosecutors are trying to make in the areas of political corruption are very hard to prove and uh, may be going too far. And I think that that's where, when prosecutors are trying to push the envelope, that's where All right, it gets but let's to be, be very specific. Critical. Shelley Silver was one of the three men in the room, Assembly Speaker, Senate Majority Leader, and the Governor, okay? He clearly used his office. He created a fund, taxpayer dollars, for, uh, you know, mesothelioma victims. The doctor that got appointed, he funneled the cases to Shelley Silver's law firm, and Shelley Silver profited from it. How is that a gray area? Um, to me, when we start watering down what the expectations is of, of, you know, public officials, shame on all of us. I mean, to me, this was cut and dry. And then, you know, with burner phones here and, and all the rest with the Skelos numbskull, I mean, how is that not corruption? Well, then I think then they'll be convicted. I mean, I think that's why we have, that's why we have trials. That's why we have courts of law. And I think that's why you have a jury by its peers, right? So that's what, I think that's what- Were you surprised Prococo got convicted? Uh, you know, I think it's hard for me to say because he's a friend, so it's 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 difficult for me to really, it's it's really hard for me to be objective. You know, I never thought he would be in this place to be in the first place. Um, uh, I I accept the I accept the verdict for what it is. Um, so it's it's hard for me to it's, it's really hard for me to be objective mm -hmm. on this, to be honest with you. Um, it's funny, Amy, who for a person. Um, <laughs> who has taken on the unenviable tax of documenting, um, if not the corrupt, the offensive daily dealings of this administration. Is there a part of you that says what is corrupt, it, you know, it's like the old definition of pornography. I know it when I see it. it. It's, to me, I don't understand how this has become such a fungible definition, but yet it is. I, I'm watching this stuff, I'm almost laughing because it seems like amateur land compared to what we're seeing now right. every day. I mean, breaking into the doctor's office and <laughs> threatening him and taking medical records and it's Tuesday. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that we've set now the bar for corruption at a whole new spot because nationally we've never had somebody leading our country who had all these potential conflicts of interest and has readily exploited them. Sort of like our constitution has sort of these sets of norms in a way the, right. of what should be allowed and we have so far gone beyond those in terms of enriching yourself by using the political power and directing our foreign policy very specifically to enrich yourself. So this other stuff at the New York level, yeah, it's you know being dealt with in the courts. But, but I would argue that the, the definition is fungible and, and you and I have talked about this before because even the stuff that is accepted and above board is to a certain degree corrupt. And, and that's the influence of money into the political system. Even if a group that, that you agree with uh, gives you money for agreeing with their position and advocating on behalf of their position, there's a certain element of corruption in that because you are committing your official act and you're committing your official actions to try to further the interest of that well, let's group. Let's be honest. Uh, uh, all disclosure here, Senator Menendez, very good friend to this program. He misused his office. He advanced the interests of a friend of his and... Um, he did so, obviously, with the power of a U.S. senator behind it but, here. But For him even, to say that he's vindicated at the end of it, I have a problem but with that's it. Even, I but, agree with you, but that's even a more personal th than what I was getting. If you're a, you a pro-gun Republican and you take money from the Second Amendment or, or take money from the NRA to advocate in favor of lax gun laws, you're really taking money from this group and pushing, using your official capacity to advance the interests of but, that group. But it's, that's legal. It, it's but, legal, but it's still corrupt. And, be, and well, once you I lower the bar to that level, then really, I what's don't to know. stop anything from well, going? See, look, uh, let me tell you why this is all, in many ways, a very blurred line. And I, I'll take it from when I ran for lieutenant governor. Not that anybody remembers, not that, oh, any, I of do. You, uh, <laughs> yes. not that any of you voted. I mean, it was a tough race. When I ran, I asked my mother if she would support me. She asked, <laughs> she asked who else was running. That's how, <laughs> hard, the, positions. That's how hard the, <laughs> the race was. Yeah. But uh, when, I, when I first ran for that office, uh, somebody gave me uh, $15,000, which way back when was a lot of money. And I remember thinking to myself, this was tantamount to, to me being able to, you know, to, to buy 
a, a car back then, which was a lot of money. Yeah. So when this person called me, you know, I felt an obligation to call him because it, not because of anything other than the, the awesome responsibility that this person had so much invested in me to give. Now, you might call that corrupt. You may say that I'm doing this because there, there's just this feeling. See, see this I don't. The, see, for me, where these going cases have point, been different is, and maybe that's in the Bob McDonald but that's where, case. But that's right. where the blur comes because you feel you f you, you're going to pick that phone up because of that connectivity. Well, that's to where be the fair money to you, Mick Mulvaney, right, oh, who's had now a couple different roles in this administration, he told the story in the last week that, hey, if you're in Congress yeah. and you don't write a check to me, I'm not taking your call. If you write me a check and then you call me, I might take your phone call. And now, that's I've what had, we're normalizing. And I, I've had a couple of congressmen yeah. who've said that's offensive, that's not how I operate. Yeah. However, to me it's different if you have to play the unseemly game of raising money and doing everything attached to it and then taking phone calls. It's different than when you're in office to use your office and abuse the public trust to advance your own personal self-interest or that of a contributor. But a now campaign and elected are two different things. Maybe but, but it's, a, once it's in the light of day now, though. I mean, right. the thing is that we've like gotten so low down when Mulvaney feels like he can actually just say that in public to 1,300 American bankers. We're at the point now where it's all coming out into the light of day, and we're going to deal with all this. I think at the end of all of this, when Trump is gone, we're going to have to come up with, as a country, a new set of guidelines because the American people are thoroughly fed up, not just with the, the corruption locally, but what's happening nationally, and the whole way the system functions is not representing we the people. And I think there's going to be an outcome for both parties are going to have to resalvage to themselves after the era of Trump. Um, it's gone on on both sides, as you yep. point out. And once you're in office, you're instantly running for office again. You're a candidate again the day yeah. you're uh, an office holder. I mean, it's I, I'm naive on all this. This is Pollyannish, but until you get rid of all the money in politics, it's all just a matter See, of degrees. I don't think I'm trying to be realistic. You can't. But once you're in office, I would have a higher standard, and, and maybe it's not even through the judicial courts. But yeah, Menendez was reprimanded. But I'm sorry. I should mean, it is a fraternity or a sorority, whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. There should be higher standards within the electoral bodies. And if Silver wasn't kicked out. Um, you know, it, it shouldn't have been his choice, and the same thing for Skelos. All right, certainly we're going to keep coming back to this, unfortunately. But coming up next, perhaps Trump's is not the biggest problem facing the GOP as we head towards the midterms. Maybe the candidates themselves are a bigger concern. Trust me, when you see this rogues gallery, you'll know what I'm talking about.